we will monitor these questions for the Q&A period at the end. Now, because of the number of participants, we will not be using the raise hand function this evening. All right, so um, without further ado, it is such a pleasure for me to introduce our speakers who are volunteering their time, having generously planned this amazing webinar for us. Um, free of charge, uh, thank you so much, uh, Natalie and Kim. And uh, we would like to say that Kim is a French Immersion Elementary support teacher in Kingston. In 2015, Kim earned her master's degree of education in Queen's University. She also focused, I'm sorry, she earned a master's degree of education, yeah, at Queen's University. She focused on her research on ev evidence-based instructional practices that support students with reading difficulties in French immersion. She also developed a resource for parents called Supporting and Inspiring Your Child with Reading Difficulties in the French Immersion Program. In 2020, Kim received the Associate Level Orton Gillingham Certificate and most recently worked with the IDA here to facilitate workshops for educators, parents of dyslexia, and parents of dyslexic children across Ontario. Kim volunteers her time with the Learning Disability Association of Kingston and is a strong advocate for parents in French as a second language with dyslexia. Natalie is a French immersion educator in Kingston and area. Natalie graduated with a bachelor's degree in child and youth studies in 2004 and a bachelor of education in 2005. She received her Orton Gillingham Associate Training in 2018, and she received her multi-sensory math certificate in 2021. Natalie is a consultant with Dyslexia Canada, where she works to advocate for children and families with dyslexia across Canada. Natalie received her FSL Specialist and Special Education AQs and is registered with the Ontario College of Teachers. She volunteers her time as a board member with Youth Diversion, a local nonprofit support support, oh sorry, a local nonprofit agency supporting at-risk youth and is a volunteer mentor with the RISE, a charity that provides people with, history, with a history of mental health or addictions a path forward towards sustained self-employment. So Kim and Natalie will be demonstrating tonight how they provide structured literacy intervention to their students in French immersion settings. So welcome, Kim and Natalie, and thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us. I'm Natalie. I'm Kim. Okay, guys, we have a super packed webinar tonight. Um, hopefully you received a copy of our slides. Um, we're not gonna be covering all the elements in the slides this evening because that would take us hours to go through. And unfortunately, we just have one hour together tonight. Um, however, the information on the slides was given to you for your own knowledge and understanding so that you have a little bit of background about some of the research that supports the strategies that we're going to be sharing tonight. So tonight our focus is going to be on strategies that you can use in your classroom. Um, we may touch on certain slides throughout and refer to them as we go along. So we want to be clear that these strategies can be used in all levels of instruction. So tier one classroom, tier two, small group, and tier three, one-on-one. -on -one. So when we're talking about these strategies, you can use them in any of those tiers. And these strategies are designed for all FSL programs. I work in core French and extended immersion, and I use them in my practice. And I work in early immersion from grades one to grade six in uh, small group support, but also in a French immersion uh, FDK kindergarten classroom. So the strategies that we're sharing this, this evening come from the foundations of Orton Gillingham approach. Um, we received our training with Lisa Furr at Fundamental Learning and the Orton Gillingham approach has been around for many years and originated in the 1930s. So these are tried and true um, approaches that we're using. So in case you haven't noticed, we speak really quickly and we go fast, um, but don't worry, you're gonna receive a copy of the recording so you can always go back and listen to the strategies again so that you can learn a little bit more. So I'm gonna move in, we're gonna move into screen sharing and back to in-persons for some demonstrations. So as mentioned, if you wanna see us larger, you'll be able to pull the button up. Um, there's kind of like a corner that you can pull so that you can see us in a larger screen while we're screen sharing. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so this evening we are going to focus on strategies to support language in your classroom. We're going to look at three different areas. Reading, so we're going to talk about phonological awareness. 
the use of a code pack to help support your child with the sounds of the French language, the use of decodable text. Once we've developed the code pack, we're gonna move on to printing. So how we can explicitly teach handwriting skills and practice regularly. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the sky grass ground printing approach. And then we're gonna talk about spelling or encoding and the use of the simultaneous oral spelling. The key here is that everything throughout what we're doing is multi-sensory. So we want students using auditory, visual, kinesthetic, and tactile throughout each approach. That's what structured literacy is truly about. Okay, so regardless of which language a student is learning in, all students, especially those with learning disabilities, they need explicit, systematic, cumulative, and multi-sensory instruction. Over the last 30 years, there has been research to support the use of structured literacy. Unlike some typical approaches that um, we may find in classrooms over the last 20 years, such as balanced literacy, maybe guided reading. Okay, we're gonna go through a little fun activity here together. I'm sure many of you have seen these reading strategies and posters or something that looks quite similar to this. And so the question we wanna ask ourselves when we're looking at this, and we're gonna share with you some effective strategies in a few minutes is, what are we missing here? When we look at these strategies, what's going on? We always want kids to be focusing on the graphemes, which are the letters that they see on the page and the phonemes, which are the sounds. And we don't want them looking away from those graphemes or from the words. So often we see kids using a variety of strategies like guessing, context, looking at pictures, rereading and skip the word. So as we can see in this example, we have eagle eye, look at the picture, think what's in the picture, what starts with the beginning letter? Unfortunately, this is moving our children's eyes away from the graphemes on the page. Often the picture is not linked to the words and as a result is not a helpful strategy for students that are learning how to decode. So that one we're gonna say is a eh. Next up, we've got lips the fish. Get your mouth ready, say the beginning sound. Now, this is partially great. The get your mouth ready part is fantastic. We do want our students to have their mouths and lips ready so that they're ready to read those words and graphemes. However, say the beginning sound, that's not as helpful because if they don't know the sound, if they don't know what the grapheme is, they're not gonna be able to say the sound. So this one we give a Next up, we have stretchy snake. Slowly stretch each letter around sound to make the word. Shh, it, perfect, I love this one. This is what we want students to do. We want them to recognize all the sounds that are in the word. So that one's okay. Chunky monkey, break the word into chunks you already know. So this one's suggesting that we break it into words like at. So we have mat, flat, splatter. Unfortunately, unlike stretchy snake, which has the correct strategy, this one we don't necessarily want them to break into these parts. We want them to focus on each individual sound so that they can later encode it as well, which is spell it. So this one we give up. Eh. Try and lion. Oh, try to reread the sentence and think what makes sense. This one for me is one of the um, most difficult ones to see because as we know and working with students with dyslexia or with reading difficulties, those students are trying. They are trying harder than anyone in the classroom. And so we really don't want to be asking them to try harder because they're giving their all. Um, Rereading sentences is not going to help if they could not read it to start with. And what makes sense? Well, if they didn't read it and they didn't understand it, they're not going to be able to figure out what makes sense. So this one, we give a big ah. uh, Skippy the frog, skip the tricky word, just read to the end. Well, I mean, this makes sense. Never, because what if the word that they're skipping is the most important word in this sentence for meaning? We never want students skipping words. We want them looking at the graphemes and decoding. So this one, we also give a big no. And the last one is Flippy the dolphin, which says flip the vowel sound. So essentially what they're asking us to do is try different vowel sounds. I'm not gonna discount this one because this can be a good strategy. So for example, if we have students reading the word avec, they may initially try, especially if they're early in their reading, they may read it as a, a book. And we may say, mm, quel est l'autre son de, uh, de la lettre uh? And they might say, eh, and then we would go avec. 
So I'm not necessarily against this one. We just have to be careful how we use it. So as you can see, these are some strategies that are typically employed in a reading program that many of us use. And um, we're gonna offer some suggestions to how to work on these. Kim's gonna show you a little bookmark that she has that is helpful. So we just modeled and just showed you some strategies that are ineffective. So we decided to take a look at structured literacy and incorporate some of the elements of structured literacy to make our own bookmarks. So we have two bookmarks here that um, I know it's a little bit difficult to read, but we've created two bookmarks. One is for the emergent pre-reader and it has a lot of phonological awareness uh, strategies on it. So these are things that pre-readers need to master to lay a great foundation for the reading process. Once students have um, consolidated these skills, then we have another bookmark that gives very, very concrete reading strategies that never involve guessing. Sorry, Natalie was covering your face there. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're going to keep going here. So now that we know what we don't want our students doing, we're gonna give you an example of what we may see in a classroom in terms of texts. So often with, um, the question is why students struggle with level text, which is what we see very often in our classrooms um, and predictable text, text. We often like to use predictable text with our students. And we're gonna go through a quick example here of why this may not be as effective. So I'm reading through my book, I'm going, the tigre va au zoo, le lion va au zoo, l'éléphant va au zoo, le, I look at the picture, I see a snake. The only word that I have for snake that I know is serpent. So I go, le serpent va au zoo. Ooh, oh, c'est incorrect, Natalie. Ah, oh, c'est incorrect, c'était cobra. So it should have been le cobra va au zoo, but because I was focused on looking at the picture, I was not looking at the graphemes or the letters that are in the word. So it actually started with a C followed by an O. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that our students are not relying on predictable text. So that was a pattern. So they're sort of looking through following that pattern. What means ends up happening is that they've got that va o zu, so they're no longer reading those words and they're just memorizing them. And then they're guessing and using the pictures as context cues, which often happens, happens in level text. So we always want our students focusing on the graphemes and making that connection to the phonemes, what we call decoding. So the big question is, what do we need to become skilled readers? Or what are the effective parts of reading approaches that we can employ in our classroom? So this is the reading rope. And it is a amazing graphic that shows us all of the various components that are involved in skilled reading. And skilled reading comes way at the end there, as you can see, and it's the fluent execution and coordination of word recognition and text comprehension. So students are reading fluently and they're comprehending what they're reading. So at the top, we have language comprehension. And this tends to be the area that can be a little bit more of a struggle for our French language learners, especially because as you can see, the first two components are background knowledge and vocabulary. And these can be a little bit more difficult for our FSL learners because they don't have that vocabulary that they come in naturally with or the background knowledge necessarily, especially if they speak a different language at home. And so those are really important components. We then have language structures, which looks at syntax and semantics, verbal reasoning, inference, metaphor, and literacy knowledge, print concepts, and genres. And then at the bottom of our rope, which is an equally important part, kind of the starting point, we have word recognition, phonological awareness, decoding, and sight recognition of familiar words, which we um, would typically do through orthographic mapping as a research-based approach. And so today we're going to be focusing on that bottom part, the word recognition, the phonological awareness, decoding, and sight recognition. All right, so as Natalie said, there are six components to an effective structured literacy program, both in English and in French. There are six different components that must be integrated together in order to be effective. The first element of a structured literacy program is phonological awareness, which is essentially a fancy word for sound skills. It talks about word manipulation and manipulating sounds and words. The second element of structured literacy is phonics and word recognition. This is the aspect where there are letter sound associations and it is essential for the decoding, 
which is reading, and encoding, which is spelling process. And in order to do it properly, it has to be visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. Fluency is the third component, and that is the ability to read words quickly and automatically. Vocabulary, as Natalie has already said, is an incredibly critical component, particularly in FSL programs. We want to make sure that students have a rich vocabulary, so when they are reading off the page, they are gaining meaning from the words that they are reading. Listening and reading comprehension, we all know that that is a very important aspect of the reading process, but also a more complex one. And then finally, we're going to touch on reading, uh, sorry, written expression in printing and handwriting and how important written expression is to structured literacy. And an overriding component of all of this is oral language. And so we want our students to have a very rich oral language base so that all of these elements can be implemented effectively. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to speak to you a little bit about phonological awareness. As I said, phonological awareness is a fancy term for sound skills. And in order to read any language, a child must be able to break apart, break apart the sounds and words. And phonological deficiencies can be an indicator for future reading disabilities. So this really is the foundation to the reading process. We want to make sure that students consolidate these phonological awareness skills. Also, importantly, phonological skills are cross-linguistic. And that means by practicing them even in English, it can help strengthen a child's French reading skills. So often I have parents say to me, I don't speak French, I don't know how to support my child at home. And so I often say practicing phonological awareness skills in English at home will actually enhance their reading abilities in French. Um, so we're going to do some demonstrations here. We're going to walk through the different elements of the phonological awareness skills. The first element of phonological awareness is word awareness. And word awareness is understanding that sentences are made up of words and words are actually made up of individual sounds. So as a classroom teacher, I would ask my students to count the sounds in a sentence for me. So I might say, mes amis, est-ce que vous pouvez compter les sons dans la phrase le chat est brun? Le chat est brun. Bravo. Now, obviously, this is not her first time doing this. This is something you would model, and she has now shown me that she has mastered this skill. The second element of phonological awareness is alliteration. And alliteration is beginning sound, so it's listening. And all of the phonological awareness uh, activities are sound skills, so it's only the auditory process. Alliterations are identifying the beginning sounds. And so what I might do is use the names of the students in my class, and I'll say, mm, mes amis, Il y a quelqu'un ici qui a le nom qui commence avec le son B. Est-ce que tu connais quelqu'un qui a le nom qui commence avec le son B? Uh, Bruno. Excellent. And I might also ask students to um, tell me what the beginning sound is in a word. So we can do it both ways. So I will say the, the word serpent. Uh, mes amis, est-ce que vous pouvez me dire Qu'est-ce que c'est le premier son dans le mot serpent? Excellent. So you can play games like that and uh, use names in the class. Thirdly, third element is syllable awareness. Now, syllable awareness can be a little bit difficult. And I know typically people like to clap the syllables. But what happens if we just ask kids to clap the syllables? You get a lot of clapping. So one strategy that I use for beginning learners um, when it comes to syllable awareness is we put our hand under our chin and we exaggerate how to say the word. So if I were to ask my class to count the syllables in the word mouton or mouton, I would demonstrate by going mouton. And then I would ask them to repeat after me, mouton, mouton. And it has to be in an exaggerated way. So each time the chin hits the hand is one syllable. Once students have figured that out, then maybe you can incorporate the clapping activities. Rhyming. Rhyming skills are essentially the opposite of alliteration. It's detecting ending sound patterns. And this is incredibly important to the phonological awareness process. 
So I might ask my students to do two activities for me. Mes amis, um, je vais vous donner deux mots. Est-ce que c'est deux mots? Rime, mm, bateau, château. Oui, bravo. So she can identify the two words that I have given her as being rhyming words. And then I might mix it up and give her one word that, uh, two words that don't rhyme. Then a little bit more challenging is I'm going to ask her to give me a word that rhymes with a word that I give her. So this one is a little bit more challenging. And the interesting thing is it is okay if they give us nonsense words. There has been some bit debate whether or not nonsense words um, can be used in structure. Let's say we, when we talk about uh, rhyming, we do accept rhyming words because we just wanna make sure that they have the right, correct word endings. So um, Natalie, est-ce que tu peux me donner un mot qui rime avec bouton? Mouton. Excellent. So she was able to give me a real word. Um, this will greatly depend on a child's French vocabulary. The fifth element of phonological awareness is phonemic awareness. And this is a more specific um, element because it talks about manipulating sounds in words. So it's the phonics, it's the sounds in the words. So the first activity for phonemic awareness might be isolating sounds. For example, um, mes amis, Qu'est-ce que c'est le premier son dans le mot bus? B. Excellent. Qu'est-ce que c'est le son final dans le mot bus? Bravo. So she was able to like identify the beginning and ending sounds, blending sounds. This is essentially the reading process because kids have to learn to blend sounds together in order to make syllables, in order to make words. And so blending is um, an incredibly important aspect. So I'm going to use a strategy called tap, tap, glisse. And tap, tap, glisse incorporates a kinesthetic motion. So I put my arm out and for tap, tap, glisse, I say the beginning sound by tapping my shoulder. For example, b, and the middle sound, I tap my elbow, u, and the ending sound, I tap my wrist, s. And then I ask them to slide or glisser les sons. Um, mes amis, est-ce que vous pouvez me dire qu'est-ce que c'est ce mot? B, U, S, B, S, B, S, excellent. Now, if that was too difficult, I might backpedal a little bit and give a two sound word. Mes amis, est-ce que vous pouvez me donner un mot? Uh, est-ce que vous pouvez me dire le mot? M, A, Ma, excellent. And then you want to get progressively longer. So up to maybe five or six phonemes. The key here is that if students are not picking up, we can model it for the students and we continue to model it. So I might be going mm, a, ma, u, a, la, and having them repeat it back to me until they've mastered it. And we keep doing that until they're able to do it independently. Um, segmenting sound. So this is the opposite of blending. We are stretching words apart and we want kids to stretch the words apart and count the sounds. So, mes amis, est-ce que vous pouvez me dire les sons dans le mot kiwi? And I would probably model it first by raising my hand. She's already done this, so she's going to count the sounds. Kiwi, k, i, w, i. Combien, s, a, il y a combien de sons? Quatre. Excellent. And you'll also want to have the student repeat the word back to you just to make sure that they're saying the right word so that they haven't misheard what you said. Um, again, this can get progressively more complex with um, larger words um, or longer words. So deleting sounds, deleting sound tasks. For example, mes amis, je vais dire le mot beau. Répète, vaut. Vaut. Maintenant, dis le mot vaut sans v. Oh, excellent. Now, adding phonemes. So this is the aspect of adding a sound to a word. Mes amis, est-ce que vous pouvez dire le mot âge? Âge. Maintenant, au début, dis le son k. Cage. Excellent. Now, the most complex of all of the phonological awareness skills um, and in the phonemic awareness element is substituting and manipulating sound. So we're basically, I tell the kids, this is like a magic trick. We're gonna take one word and we're gonna change it to a different word. So substituting phonemes can happen with beginning sounds, middle sounds and ending sounds. And so I will demonstrate um, one of each. So mes amis, 
Est-ce que vous pouvez dire le mot bol? Bol. Excellent. Maintenant, au lieu de b, tu vas dire s. Sol. Bravo. So that is um, change the beginning sound. Now we're going to change the middle sound. Ça, c'est plus difficile. Uh, mes amis, est-ce que vous pouvez dire le mot mur? Mur. Maintenant, au lieu de u, est-ce que tu peux dire e? Mer. Bravo. That is, she's doing very well. Now we're going to manipulate and change the ending sounds of a word. Um, mes amis, est-ce que vous pouvez dire le mot uh, la? La. Change la, la, le son. A, A, I. Li. Bravo. So these are really important. Now, a fantastic free phonological awareness tool that you can find online is called the PASS test. And the PASS test was developed by Dr. Kilpatrick. And he has um, e developed the book Equip for Reading Success. And it's a comprehensive step-by-step -step program for developing phonemic and phonological awareness skills. Those are sound skills and um, word manipulation and sound manipulation. This is one of the best tools out there and it is free. Um, one of the most important things about the past test is that it includes the element of automaticity that kids have two seconds to give you the answer. So they're not, we're not giving them a long time to figure it out. We want their phonological awareness skills to be automatic. And you can be practicing with students in your classroom in small groups and one-on-one. -on -one. So you'll work with your classroom in, as a whole class for an activity. And it's okay if not all your students are picking up on it in that moment, because you're going to confirm their ability to do it in small groups and one-on-one. -on -one. And they're also just seeing other students do it and practicing. The other important component as well is that this screener, we can use this with students in kindergarten and um, phonological awareness will help us predict whether students are going to have reading difficulties such as dyslexia later on. So we can really use this as a predictor in kindergarten to give us an idea of which students may be struggling with reading come grade one and two so that we can continue to work with them and ensure that they're supported properly with their reading. All right, so now this is the exciting part. I love this part. This is using code packs. Now we learned about code packs in our Orton Gillingham um, training and with Lisa. And so we're going to show you quickly how to make a code pack. Essentially all you need are some cue cards or recipe cards that you can buy at Dollarama. I have colored cards, but white cards are fine too. You can also use cardstock to make them larger in your classroom for whole classroom instruction, or you can also put them up on your whiteboard, smart board, or um, there are online versions of card packs that you can use for virtual learning as well. So on a code pack, you're going to have three things. Now I have my vowels on one color card and I have my consonants on another color card and I have my diagram or my digraphs digram, on a different color card. So the most important thing is on the front of the card, you want to have the grapheme. You want to have the letter. So this is what a blank one looks like. And then this is what a completed one looks like. So you're going to write the grapheme on the front of the card. That is the letter. On the back of the card, you are going to write a key word that has the phoneme or the sound that you want to hear. So I have for la lettre A, j'utilise le mot acrobat. Um, now, you will know that there are several graphemes or letters that have multiple phonemes. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that for the letters C, G, Y, and other um, vowel sounds, you want to make sure that you have the different phonemes. For example, la lettre C fait le son K, K comme cadeau, et la lettre C aussi fait le son S, par, uh, comme cyclone, a ciseau. So you want to make sure that you have a keyword that works for you and your class. Often people ask me, what are the keywords? The keywords really don't matter as long as you're consistent. I like to use with the kindergarten class that I teach in, I like to use um, animals because animals are usually familiar. One very important aspect of the code packs is we don't want to put pictures on. So you'll notice that I have la lettre A, la lettre A, 
And I have the keyword acrobat, but I don't have any pictures because what we want is we want for this to become automatic for students and we don't want them relying on photos or picture cues. Now, we are going to do a demonstration of how to effectively use a code pack in a classroom setting. Again, this is for a whole class. Those kids who are struggling with it, you can bring them into a small group and do some small group work. And those kids who are really, really struggling, you might wanna give them some one-on-one -on -one time, also can be done in the classroom setting. So I have done this before with my students, so they are very competent at the code packs. The first thing you want to do is show them the grapheme, show the letter, show them what it looks like. Next, you want to say the sound. You want to say the phoneme of the grapheme. And then you want to say the keyword. For this one, it's acroba. And then finally, to make it kinesthetic and multi-sensory, sensory, you want to draw it. So I love doing drawing it in the sky. Kids love drawing it in the sky. And then that way, I can have a quick view of who is doing it backwards and who is doing it correctly. And also you want to make sure that you do these code packs until they are automatic. We don't want kids um, moving on until these sounds have been consolidated. And it's very important that students are able to do this automatically so that we can move on to blending and segmenting and creating syllables and words. So here we go. We're gonna do a little bit of a demonstration on how to do a code pack in a whole class. Mes amis, est-ce que vous pouvez me dire le, la lettre, le son, le mot, et puis écrire? A, A, acrobat, E, E, je, I, I, Igloo. O, O, Océan. She's doing very well. U, U, Usine. Now, I like to start with vowels because vowels are pretty important in language. And then I might continue because she did so well. I'm going to continue with some of the consonants that we have already practiced. This is not new. L, U, Lune. M, M, mouton. S, s, serpent. T, t, tortue. You'll also notice that as I'm saying these, I'm not putting an emphasis on the end of some of my consonants. And so mm -hmm. often we have a pattern of, um, or we'll often use, we'll add a unemphasized sound to the end of our consonants. So we'll say, B. Huh, huh. And unfortunately, that can be problematic for some of our dyslexic learners and struggling readers because it sounds like there's an extra vowel sound. It actually sounds like the sound uh, is attached to that. So when they go to encode that word and spell it or even read it, they may attach that sound to it. So they may try to be spelling the word bus and they'll go buh, be, uh. So we want to be really careful to cut those sounds off and not put that extra sound at the end. So it's b, t, g, d, p. Yeah. Oh, okay. thank you. Um, now I'm going to show her a new grapheme. Um, I'm going to introduce something new that she has not seen before. So I'm going to model how we do it. <gasps> Mise en me. Voici quelque chose qu'on appelle un digramme. Un digramme, ça c'est deux lettres ensemble qui fait un son. So these are two letters together, but they make one sound. Ooh. So, mes amis, C, H fait le son sh. Est-ce que vous pouvez répéter sh? Maintenant, fait la lettre C, H, mais D, sh. I'm going to do it in the sky. She's going to do it on her whiteboard. Shh. Excellent. Et le mot qui commence avec le son sh, c'est cha. Cha. Excellent. So I'm going to add this to my code pack, not of mastered sounds, but of so sounds that are not yet uh, automatic. I want to keep those separate because we really want to focus our time on the sounds that are not yet automatic. Now, we are going to move on to um blending sounds so i'm going to take 
a few sounds and I'm going to blend them together. I use this in my small groups. In, in um, my class lessons, I use the magnets with the cookie sheet and I have the students manipulate sounds. So we can go a, a, e, o, u. Bravo, mes amis. So we've mastered beginning sound or words at the beginning sound. Ooh. Maintenant, on va changer U pour M. M, U, M. Mo. Mi. Maintenant, je vais changer le premier son. Si. Se. Sa. Maintenant, je vais changer le premier son encore. Ta. Te. T and this can continue. So once kids have, um, once you have taught the blending and consolidated it, you can introduce this great little thing that I make for all of my students called a flip book. And flip books are a great way for kids to practice their blending sounds at home, but you do not want to send them home until you have taught the concept. So I have all of the consonants on the left hand side. I have all my simple vowels and vowel blends or digraphs on the right hand side. So we can make multiple words. Um, now, uh, now going to practice. Ba. B. B. C. D. And then we can keep going. D. Okay, so these flip books are great for practicing even some more uh, difficult um, blends. And you can do vowels in front of consonants to practice those sounds as well, because this is just about practicing sounds together. They don't actually have to be real words at this point, because some of those are just syllables that exactly. are in words. Exactly. Okay, so those are the code packs. Um, we're going to move on to decodable text now. I'm going to move back to screen sharing here and we're going to go ahead a little bit. Okay, so decodable text. This is sort of where when we ask ourselves, what about leveled readers? What do we use instead? We use decodable text. Decodable text is critical for early reading instruction. And what decodable text is, is it's carefully sequenced to progressively include words that are consistent with the letter sound relationships that have explicitly been taught. And this is the key with structured literacy. It requires explicit instruction all the way through at each step. Why do we use these? Because we want to ensure that students are successful when they're reading. What about the leveled readers? Well, leveled readers are not decodable. As you saw with our snake example, our serpent and our cobra, um, they end up being problematic for early readers and those with reading difficulties because the students may not be familiar with all of the letters and sounds that are in the book. So leveled readers are really great for vocabulary and topic learning. If you're in a primary grade, you can reorganize them into baskets based on interests and topics so that students can explore them on their own free reading time. So the next question we always get when we talk about decodable text is, where do I find decodable text? Um, because this may even be a new word for you. You may not have even ever heard of the word decodable text. And so the challenge with decodable text in any language is that it's gonna depend on your scope and sequence. And every teacher may end up having their own scope and sequence. If I pick up decodable text from a specific program, it may not follow the scope and sequence that I've been following in my classroom. And my scope and sequence is gonna be different than Kim's because it's gonna be based on the students and their individual needs as a class and even as their individual needs within small groups and one-on-one. -on -one. And so the best way is to create your own. I know guys, I get it, we're busy. You're like, no, not another thing we have to do. Please don't tell us that. Um, but really it is the most effective approach um, in terms of classroom because you're building your text as you go through your scope and sequence. We're, we may have a class that comes to us, especially in kindergarten or grade one, where the students are familiar with all of their consonants and the next year they may not be. And so my decodable text is gonna change based on what they're familiar with. And when you're creating your own text, you can start simple. So it's gonna start with syllables. We'll move on to words, phrases, and then eventually sentences. We want to forget about all of those fancy pictures. So when we looked at that livret de son, 
we're not, we're not, we're not focusing on pictures. We want students to just be excited by reading and they will be because they're being successful. The pictures are distracting for them. Um, and remember too, that you're not creating books here. Like we're not asking you to create your own book series. We're asking you that, like, that's crazy. Um, that's crazy talk. I know you know that. Um, so we're not creating books in this capacity. We're creating text. And so if I'm working on the sounds, my first list of text may just be the sound O with all of the consonants in front of them. So as an example, I have, um, we've created this sheet as an example. I'm gonna stop sharing for one minute here so you can see. And so this may be our first decodable text. So we may end up, we may have been working on the sound A with the consonants. And so we're just gonna create decodable text that goes ba ka da fa ga ja la ma pa ra sa ta that's our decodable text. Um, and then we may, we may include other, as we introduce the song, uh, we're be, so, de, fe, ge, je, 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 le, me, pe. So we're introducing it as we go along and building our own text for our students based on what we're learning and what we're teaching. And so in this example, um, as you can see on the side of the screen here, I'll go back to the other one. I have um, a list of words in this one. So this is the song, a. Uh, with the students assuming that they have learned all of their consonant sounds and le son a. So they're reading mal, pal, val, lac, sac, crack. If they have not learned the son er, if they haven't learned r, I'm not gonna put those words in here. I'm gonna take those out and I'm gonna shift it around. In this one, we have some sentences and phrases. Remember, we, they're not fancy. They don't have to be fancy sentences. We just want them reading and decoding. So il a fini. That might be a sentence that I create Monday. Tuesday, I put on the board, il a le diapo. So these are all decodable, assuming that they've learned their five simple vowel sounds and their consonants. On Wednesday, I put siri a le kiwi, Thursday, le film de mimi, Friday, le papi. And then I could put it all together in a text that they could read at the end of the week. And then they feel like they've actually read a story almost. And another thing about decodable text, it's also a great opportunity to talk about vocabulary. Mais amis, qu'est-ce que c'est un kiwi? So we don't want them just decoding, but that's a great opportunity to enhance their, their vocabulary. Okay. So here we're going to move on to a quick example of fluency because that's always a big question. How do we ensure fluency with students? Um, and the best way, again, is explicit instruction through modeling. So in this example, um, here is our sample, le boa de Jojo Amal. So this is completely decodable with our consonants and our five simple vowel sounds. So we're gonna do a quick example with him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna, I would have this on the board and my students, so les élèves, on va lire cette phrase ensemble. Le boa. Le boa. De Jojo. De Jojo. Amal. Amal. And then I'm going to squish it together a little bit more so we're reading larger parts. Le boa de Jojo. Le boa de Jojo. Amal. Amal. And then finally, I'm going to model le boa de Jojo Amal. Le boa de Jojo Amal. And so we are reading that all together and we're doing it step by step so that they're building their fluency. Starting very simple, it can be two word phrases three word sentences. It doesn't have to get fancy here. So the idea being that we're modeling how to read fluently. Fluently. If there's a question, we're adding that intonation at the end. We're adding appropriate pauses so that we're teaching them how to be fluent readers. All right, moving on. Printing. Printing. A little bit up for debate. Printing is an incredibly important aspect of the process because it is kinesthetic and we really want students to understand the importance of printing their letters correctly. I love this visual because we all know as experienced educators that uh, students often get the letters B, D, P, A, Q mixed up. And often, not only do they write them incorrectly, but they can read them incorrectly. So printing and handwriting must be explicitly taught to students with reading difficulties, regardless of the language of instruction. Students need to learn how to properly and correctly form the grapheme, which is the letter of the alphabet. There are specific ways to form each letter so that students learn to differentiate the letters based on how they are written, because a lot of students just see a circle with a line on it. And 
in this graphing, it's a chair, it's a chair, it's a chair, it's a chair. But the letters, although they look different, the orientation is different. And so they are very different graphemes. Learning Without Tears is a free and excellent resource and available en français. All right, so how do we teach printing? Well, we have something called Sky Grass Ground. Um, we have the Sky Grass Ground strips here that I use in my classroom. I also use them with small groups and we use dry erase markers and we use, well, we use my husband's socks to erase them, but you can use tissues or you can use some reusable wipes. So Skygrass Ground helps students print their letters correctly because it shows them the, orient, um, the uh, formation of the letter is either in the sky, the grass, or the ground. So all letters, I always say to my students, we are most comfortable when we go to the park sitting on the grass. So just like us, letters like to sit on the grass. Letters don't float up in the sky, letters don't go down in the ground, they sit on the grass. So I always start with what I call my magic C letters. The magic C letters are the letters C, A, D, J, O, A, Q. So I show my students using sky grass ground how we can turn la lettre C into la lettre D. La lettre D starts with the magic C, la lettre A, la lettre O, la lettre J, et la lettre Q. We don't see the letter B in here. Letter B is not a magic C word. With the letter B, on commence avec le bâton et puis on fait la belle. So we have to make sure that students draw or print these letters differently so that they can begin to differentiate and distinguish the difference between bay a day. And this is actually incredibly important. I have, um, a couple, I have three children with dyslexia and this was when I learned this strategy in Mark Martin Gillingham training, it was pivotal for one of my children because they could not differentiate between B and D. She was in grade, uh, maybe grade four at the time. And I taught her the strategy and now it's, I, I don't see any of those errors in her writing because she knows how to properly form the letters so that they are, they're formed differently. And also when it comes to printing, it is very important that students are holding their pencil correctly. We have a lot of OT referrals right now because children are not holding their pencils correctly. They're using all sorts of different grasps. We use what I call the pincer grip, like a crab. And we point the pencil to us, you pick it up with your crab fingers, and then you let it fall. And that is the correct way to hold a pencil. If they are gripping it too tightly, maybe it's a full fist, they're going to suffer hand fatigue. And then what happens is they don't have the written output that they need. And often we re rely on assistive technology to help them with written output. So start with good hand um, writing habits. I see this in, I see this in later years. I have students in grade seven and eight that still are using very <laughs> untraditional writing techniques for their hands. My hands get so sore when I write. I'm like, I know you got to hold your pencil differently. So it's also very important. And this is something that maybe not everyone realizes, but when we write our letters, our letters are actually written and go from left to right. So if you watch while I draw la lettre D, I'm actually moving in a left to right direction. When I do the letter B, I do le bâton and then la belle. So when you print a letter, you're actually going in the same direction that we read. So you really want to emphasize that because often we talk about how kids are um, reading backwards or not reading things properly. So we want to make sure the letter orientation is left to right, left to right. So if you think about it, all letters actually move in the same direction as we read. And one more strategy that we can see on here is this hand with the B and the D. So this can be especially helpful for students when they're reading or when they're writing for formation to decide which way the B and D goes. I use this with, with my younger child right now because when she's look, reading a word, she can't decide whether she needs the B or D or even when she's writing it. And so we've taught her that this looks like a bed. The two balls go together. B-ed goes together. 
P the other direction. Q's come up less often, so we don't worry about that one as much, um, but this is a really helpful strategy. And before we move on, I'm just going to say that it's very important too when we teach printing that we use it to help students encode. So I might say a sound, okay, mes amis, je vais dire un son. Le son c'est écrit le son so I use sky grass ground and I see if they can match the phoneme, which is the sound, with the grapheme, which is the letter. So you can use your sky grass ground strips in multiple different ways. Okay, next up, we are going to talk about spelling. So spelling must focus on hearing the sounds and words and identifying the graphemes associated with sounds. So when we talked about that stretchy snake being one of those skills that works, this is why it's important because we need them to recognize all of the sounds that are in a word so that they can encode it and spell it. It needs explicit instruction. So we need to explicitly teach the strategies for spelling and repeated practice. Simultaneous oral spelling is a strategy that you can use. It's, it can be used daily with your students, um, especially beginning learners um, and to use with their phonemes and graphemes. So we're gonna do a quick demo of how this works. You can see on here though the strategies. So regardez et écoutez, répétez, segmentez les sons, nommez les lettres, écrivez en nommant les lettres et lire pour vérifier. So we'll do a quick example together. Um, Kim is going to be student here. Okay. Switching rules. Alors, Kim, le mot c'est mal. Mal. Okay, and often I will have, I print this sheet out for them and it'll be in front of them. And sometimes I'll tap to make sure that we're going through each step. So she's gonna repeat. So I say, regardez, écoutez. So she's gotta be looking at me and listening to me. Mal, she repeats. Mal. Segmentez les sons. M, mm, a, bou. I like to have students use their fingers. Again, that multi-sensory approach, they can also tap them out. M, mm, on their hand, mm, al. So they're, they're tapping those sounds, they're making some sort of association. Maintenant, nommez les lettres. M, mm, M, A, A, U, L. Okay, écrivez en nommant les lettres. So she's gonna write, she's gonna write them out, but I want her to say this letters while she's writing them. M, mm, M, A, A, U. L. Okay, lire pour vérifier. M, mm, A, U. Mal. And it's important that they're gonna read that at the end because they may not have spelled, they may have put a U here and as they read it back to themselves, they may be going mm, mm, uh, mm, No, and they'll self-correct. Mm, ah. So we wanna give that opportunity for them to self-correct all the way through any errors we want to check. So you could do this as a whole class and you'll check your students' answers and you'll address any of the issues that come up. So if any of them spell the word wrong, maybe they put an N instead of an M or a U, they use the wrong letters, then you're going to model it to the class and you're going to show them the sounds. So you're going to go M -a -l, M -a -l. Écrivez le you'll ask them to write it and you'll ask them to maybe write it two or three times so that they get that extra reinforcement while they're saying the letters out loud and then you're gonna have it read, have them read it back to themselves. And you can do this with, mul with a couple words a day, starting out and multiple words as you go along. So this would be instead of a typical spelling test. Um, this is a much more effective strategy for helping students learn how to spell. All right. So a lot of you are probably thinking, oh my gosh, this is a lot of information. Thanks Kim and Natalie, but how do I put all this together? Well, we're going to show you. So most of us are on a balanced literacy day. Sorry, a, ba <laughs> a balanced day. We're also using balanced literacy, which we now know structured literacy is more effective. We're, we're on a balanced day. So we're, we have 100 minute blocks. So we have developed for you a 50 minute structured literacy lesson plan that incorporates everything we just talked about and more. So. If you have a 50 minute block, you might want to start your lesson with a two to five minute phonological awareness drill. You can have whatever your focus is, segmenting, beginning sounds, ending sounds, uh, word manipulation, 
Secondly, you're going to do a visual drill. And that's what Natalie and I demonstrated for you earlier with the code packs. You're going to get out your code packs and you're going to do the visual drill. And after your visual drill, you're going to jump right into that blending drill. You're going to have your code packs in your hand and you're going to do a blending drill by showing the students how we blend sounds. You might want to throw in that new sound that you introduced um, yesterday as a little bit of a review. And then after your blending drill, this is a great time to introduce a new grapheme, a new sound, a new spelling pattern, something that is new. So we've been doing a lot of review and now you want to introduce a new skill. Then you want to move on to the reading of words and sentences. You want to get out that decodable text, read words, read some phrases, read some sentences. And then finally, of course, we want to get them writing. Essentially, it's a reverse code pack. You want to say the blend or you want to say the sound and have them draw it. They can do it on sky grass ground. If you need a, if you have a tactile student, you might want to do it in a bed of rice or you might want to have them do it in a bed of sand, something that makes it more tactile. This is a great time to do your SOS that Natalie just talked about, spelling dictation, and letter, hand for, um, letter formation and handwriting practice. This can take up to 15 minutes of your lesson. And then finally, text reading. Reading text and working on reading comprehension. That would take 15 minutes. Now, you don't need to do it all in 50 minutes. So the key here, we're going to kind of stop sharing right now. Um, the key is that you're going to want to be incorporating all these pieces together. So none of these are done in isolation. We're not just working on our phonological skills alone. We're working on our code packs. We're working on comprehension. We're working on vocabulary. This is kind of where the idea of balanced literacy came from. And we got a little bit lost along the way because we stopped focusing on the explicit instruction of these skills and following sort of a structured lesson for it. However, we do want to make sure all of these components are incorporated in our lessons um, all together. And so um, the important part is that we can also do this at all the levels. So we're doing this at the classroom level, the tier two where we're breaking it down for students that are having difficulties, and then that tier three where we're focusing on a specific element with individual students. There's a lot of ways that this can work in a classroom. And I'm going to give you a few ideas, but it's going to look different as it, so a lot of this is going to look different for everyone. Um, but let's say we've got that 50 minutes. So you're starting out, you're looking at you're like, oh my gosh, this is so much. I, I'm not, I'm doing some of this. Maybe I'm not doing any of this. Maybe I've never heard of any of this before. What am I going to do? So you may start out with just starting with one element. So next week, you may go back into the classroom and say, I'm going to start incorporating phonological awareness into each lesson every day. And you're going to do that. The Equip for Reading Success has some drills in there, highly worth buying, because even as we mentioned, it's not in French. These skills apply to French language learning. So you may just start with that and do that for a couple of weeks. Then you may say, OK, I'm getting comfortable. I'm going to introduce my code pack, too. So you're going to be working on your phonological awareness skills and your code packs at the same time, because if students are hearing sounds, they really want to see them, too. It's like natural for them to want to see those pieces together. Then you might start blending. You might start the introduction of new skills. And then going and as you get more comfortable introducing more components, you may find that um, this might be done through your entire 100 minute lesson block at various parts. So you may start your morning with your phonological awareness and code pack. Students may go into small groups or into little centers and they may consolidate some of that. So they may be working with the um, they may be working with little magnet boards um, for blending drill on their own, you know, in small groups. And you may be working with isolated students on specific skills. Then you may take a little break and you may come back to introducing a new skill as an entire lesson and then working on that skill. Later on, you might be reading your words and sentences together on your smart board and doing that as a mini lesson. So it can all be different. Or you may do your 50 minute lesson all together and then use your other 50 minute blocks to run different centers with those different skills throughout them where you can ensure that students are following up and using the appropriate sounds blending properly, spelling properly, working in their groups. So there are a lot of different ways that we can do that. And it's going to look different for all of us. Overall, um, we're sort of coming to the end here. Actually, we stayed on time. I can't even believe it. Um, we really like to go over. Um, the key to all of this is that we want to be using multi-sensory approaches as much as possible. Tapping, clapping, moving pieces, 
um, playing games, gross motor, large. Um, we have this lovely pillow, you know, tactile. We can write letters in it. We really want to make this experience fun and engaging, and we want them learning at the same time. All the while we're doing this, we're focusing on fluency, grammar, morphology, so the different parts of words and where they come from, vocabulary, and comprehension as an entire approach where everything is explicitly taught, because that's the key. Students need ins explicit instruction, and that's the key for structured literacy is explicit and multi-sensory instruction. All right, I think that brings us to a close. Thank you everybody for listening. And uh, we hope you learned at least a little something today. Thank you so much, Natalie and Kim. How inspiring. You have stimulated a lot of questions. You've inspired people to question their practices or enhance their practices. And they have a lot of questions about where you'll get your resources. So um, if you'd like to email Natalie and Kim, you can find them at structuredliteracyfsl at gmail.com. All right. And so, uh, you know what, your presentation brought me back to my childhood because I learned to speak French. French is my first language. And I learned my reading in French just like you did your code pack and your syllables. So, and um, the uh, decodable text right there. That was Rémi et Aline. There you go. <laughs> that was wonderful. Yeah, it brought me back to my childhood. Now, um, secondly, um, I do have a question. It was about what, what if a child were, wrote the word cadeau, K-A-D-O, at it, it, maybe you wouldn't do anything at a certain grade level, but you would do it at another grade level. How would you respond to that? Well, I'll speak first. Um, I often, when we look at um, how the children spell words, I would say, is there a different way to make the k sound? And we know that in French, there are a lot of vowels that have or a lot of graphemes that have multiple phonemes. So this is where those code facts are really important so that we really help the kids understand that there are multiple ways to make the phone name. There are multiple graphics to represent it. So. And we would also, along with that, be at a certain point, we would have taught the, we would have taught some of the rules associated with when we use C and when we use K, when we use O and when we use U, A, U, A, U. So we would teach that. If that's in an early grade, that's actually amazing. It's fantastic. Because <laughs> they've actually, they, they have all the correct sounds for the word cadeau. Yes. <laughs> Oh, so that, if, you know, if that's a young student or an early reader, a beginning reader, that is fantastic skills. Um, and we would really want to praise that. And <laughs> because they've got all, you know, they're not putting the wrong sounds in there. They have all four phonemes. Right. And uh, one more question, and then uh, Alicia will continue with more questions. We'll take turns. Um, oral communication. Uh, the question is how you best develop oral communication and how, what is its role in your FSL classroom? You, I mean, let, yeah. so I, so oral community speaking, you, you're just modeling, you're modeling, you model. you're modeling French all the time. You're, so I teach extended immersion in a grade seven program. And so students are coming in to grade seven immersion from a core French program. And so the key is I'm speaking in French, I'm modeling French, I'm using gestures. So if they're not understanding, I actually, I mean, we teach this, we teach a strategy to our students for when they don't know a word, we describe the word. So if they can't think of the word for, for pants, so they can't think of pantalon, we're gonna say, c'est un vêtement, on le met sur nos jambes. And so same thing as what we happen in a French class when we're modeling oral language. We're using different words to just, you know, if they say, qu'est-ce que c'est un pantalon? I would say, c'est un vêtement, on le porte, c'est yeah. sur nos jambes, and I'm gonna model it, I'm gonna show them. And so we're just making sure that we are, we are using French language, we're pointing, we've got visual cues, we've got images. So images are important in that. We don't want students looking at images when they're reading, but we wanna be able to, you know, Say un mur. You know, if I'm saying, tout le monde, vas-y sur le mur, I'm going to say, vas-y sur le mur. Yes. Um, we're, we're sort of engaging them that way. And we're explicitly, again, teaching them those skills of how to use the language. If they're making errors, we're teaching them how to correct those errors and to use the proper vocabulary. And I don't know if you've noticed or not, but 
we're pretty animated and it really helps if you're animated yes okay and along with that concept of uh oh is everything okay okay i just heard a sound i'm sorry um along with that concept of building oral language there was a question about reading to the students and developing oral language that way um what kind of books would you say you would read to the students in french oh um yeah so many books um oral language uh, so oral language is critical that's where our students are going to gain their vocabulary especially yeah. in a second language program is through those read alouds so in yeah. your structured literacy program you're going to want to be doing a lot of reading alouds read alouds yeah. especially in fsl because they don't have that that's the part that they don't have that background knowledge and the vocabulary yeah. And actually, uh, one, one component of my job as a student support teacher is I consult with multiple people. And one of the most valuable people that I consult with is our speech and language pathologist. We have the most incredible speech and language pathologists. I mean, I've only worked with one team, but they are phenomenal. And so our speech and language pathologist at my school has given me um, le langage oral à portée de la main. And this is a resource that she has provided me to help FSL students enhance their oral language, which then helps them with their reading comprehension. It helps them when they're decoding, pull meaning from the word. So this is a very invaluable tool and it's available in both French and in English. And also, I'm just going to throw out a little plug here for leveled readers, um, because we know we don't like them as a reading strategy, like as a book for students reading. They're great for read alouds because the students aren't reading them. So those are our topics of interest. Use your leveled readers for read alouds because they're actually going to be at more appropriate levels for your students because we know that the early readers don't have a lot of words on the pages and the later reader readers have more words which our older students will be able to auditorily understand. So that's a great way to use our leveled readers. Lovely. All right, Alicia, have you got some questions? Thank you. Before I jump to questions, I just want to say we have so many wonderful comments um, from people. I know you've been so busy. I'm sure you haven't been reading the comments as they're coming in. But thank you so much because we've had so many just wonderful comments. And I don't know if everybody, well, I'm sure everybody knows this, but you guys are teachers and you worked today and you still came out and you put this all together. And so thank you so much for that. We do have a lot of questions and I have a few I wanted to ask. The first one is about silent letters in French. How do you deal with that? There are so many. Silent, okay, so silent, uh, sorry, Alicia, I think your, your yeah. mic keeps, that's okay, she's on the okay. okay, so silent, that's a really big question and a really difficult one that actually we struggle with in terms of finding a place for it in a scope and sequence. So I'll be honest, it's one of the most challenging parts of the French language because there are so many silent letters. Um, we've sort of, I guess, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard. The, the idea is, again, you need to explicitly teach it. So at what point you add it into your scope and sequence is up to you to decide. Um, for me personally, it's not an early skill. So for me, it's definitely not a kindergarten skill. And maybe even, you know, depending upon your students' abilities in grade one, because it is a really challenging skill for them not to pronounce that, especially if they are developing their skills in reading. Um, but again, it needs to be explicitly taught. And you would start out with one letter at a time. So you would start by, for instance, introducing te, and you would work with ra and sha, and you would use words that have the silent T at the end and focus on reading those words, blending those words spelling those words. So our SOS is a perfect example. Um, so we would continue that process and because they would go ra, er, a, and then we may need to remind them at the end. Actually, remember there's silent letters in French. We've been working on this pattern with silent T's. So each sound individually is going to need to, need to be taught, especially for our struggling readers and our dyslexics. Our sort of typical readers, they're gonna pick that up naturally. They're gonna recognize the silent letters at the ends a lot more naturally. Um, than our struggling readers. And for our struggling readers, it's explicit instruction of each sound individually working on it until they've mastered it and then moving on to the next one. And more repetition than maybe um, some of the other children. But yeah. About 15% of your class, we figure maybe up to 30% 30. 30 of the class may need that extra repetition. And so, yeah, that's definitely one of the most challenging um, sort of rules in the French language would be silent letters. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks. And I just wanted to ask another one. I know my sound was cutting out there. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. 
Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, about sight words, how do you approach the um, irregular words uh, in a structured literacy um, program? So, well, I, I mean, as an early primary educator, I focus mostly on decodable text with my grade ones, twos, and threes. And so I, um, I call them red words. So once we have mastered some of the code and we have some decodable text, we sometimes get to a point where we need to insert um, non-decodable text. And I often start with e, e, s, t, is, because this is a word that it's very difficult to write a sentence without e. And so um, that would be a red word. And so I have it visually in my classroom. We practice it daily. We make sure that it's kinesthetic. And essentially, you know, kids with multiple repetitions learn to um, consolidate those, those, those words. But also it's something that Natalie referred to very quickly called orthographic mapping. And you can use that, that process as well. But um, we weren't able to do a deep dive into orthographic mapping today. But the key is that you're using, so the key with sight words is really multi-sensory approaches. Um, many of them are decodable depending upon how far you're going. So that's kind of the key too. We need to decide, um, especially look, when we look at some of those frequent words or sight words, we often see sight, I don't know, like in English, we have the dolce and the fry list or les mots fréquents. And often many of those words are actually decodable and we just sort of plug them in because we want kids to know them earlier or we haven't taught that pattern. So we need to first look through our words and decide, are they decodable? Where can we fit them in in our scope and sequence? And if we do need to use that word earlier than it follows in our scope and sequence, then we need to re be really particular about why we're teaching that. So we need to have the reason. Why are we teaching this word right now? Because it's not decodable. And um, just ensuring that there's a, that we really, do we really need that word in that sentence? Because as you saw with our decodable sentences, we can't actually make a lot of sentences without that word. Um, and so we just have to decide whether it's the right time. And then we have to ensure that we're using multi, multi-sensory repeated practice with variety, you know, again, like writing it on whiteboards, writing it in sand, writing it in the air. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a couple of questions about the alphabet and whether it should be displayed in a classroom with the keywords that go with the letters. Uh, how do you feel about that? I, I like it because it, I mean, we want the sounds, the code paths to be automatic. But as kids are encoding, they often look at my wall. Like if we're doing la lettre B et la lettre D, they will look up, b, b, oh oui, ça c'est un dinosaure, d. And so then they will, and so they are constantly referencing it for that. So I don't mind it as long as we're doing the code pack drills without the images. Well, and you just want to make sure that your key words that you have actually make the sound appropriately. <laughs> That's, yes. Because some of them, they don't blend as easily. And so the sound is hard to hear. So you want to make sure that you're using um, words where the sound is very clear in the word so that they can identify it. That brings some, me... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, and some letters are silent. Like la lettre H ne fait pas un son. So what are you going to have up there? So I think we just need to be careful. Right, right. Um, this brings to two more questions then. One of them... Um, oh yes, one person asked, where do you get good keywords for your code packs? And right. Um, and then secondly is, should you be displaying letters when you're doing phonological awareness activities? Yes to number two. <laughs> yes to number um, two. I mean, yes, you can be. It's going to depend on the student's abilities. Um, if you're just starting out with phonological awareness, you may not want to be showing the um, the graphic right away um, because you are focusing on those skills. But as they progress, yeah. you are the kids are naturally curious. They want it like they're they're going to also many of them are going to know, especially not even words. They may just know their own name. Like they just may know that X. Their name is Xander, and they know what X looks like. And so they're going to say, oh. You know, X. I know that. I know that one. And they're going to want to draw it. Or S. If their name is Sarah, they may already know what the S looks like. And if you're doing the sound S, they may want to draw it. And so that's natural for students. I think early, early, early skills. We don't necessarily need to show the graphing, 
but we do want to be introducing that quickly and pairing the two together so that students are moving very quickly from hearing the sound to seeing the graphene associated with it. The other question, which was related to keywords associated with the sounds. So, and yeah, in my class, I make up the words. Um, we we have referenced many different sources and we have come up with uh, words that we feel that will help enhance the children's vocabulary. So we want words that are familiar and not too complicated, like dinosaur, you know, that's what I use for de. And we actually do actions too. So as we're saying the sounds, we're doing the actions. Um, like Keeping in mind that if you have a graphing that has two sounds, you're gonna need two separate actions for yes. each sound. 100%. So like, Ciso. Mm -hmm. Kado. Kado. We're opening the opening So that's what we you're do. gonna need, a, if you're working with actions, you need a different, like, you can't have Gira, Ciso, yeah, being the same. For and Garçon, and we point to uh, uh, someone in the classroom. Yes, okay. And um, Alicia has more questions? It's a lot of questions. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, so there's another question, question about sounds that are similar, because there are a lot of sounds in French that are so similar. So when you're introducing those, how do you help the students to keep them straight? Great question. All, 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 all. Yes, yes. <laughs> eh, 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 eh. Um, so that, that, again, explicit instruction with each sound individually. Um, a lot of students are going to need to look in a mirror to see their mouths because your mouths actually, because they're different sounds, your mouth does make a different formation when you use, when you say those. So all, all, like there's a slight, because the ah, uh, like a n, a n is kind of has an A sound a little bit in there. So it makes a different mouth formation. So that's one of the crucial parts is teaching the different mouth formation and checking. You're like, you're gonna wanna watch students when they're forming sounds to ensure they're making A, E, right? So different mouth formation and exaggerating it and having them use mirrors if they're having difficulty. Which is incredibly difficult during a pandemic with masks on. I have to admit, this has been a nightmare for me mm -hmm. anyways, in small groups, because open and closed um, sounds can sound very similar, like and can often um, be said, the, the formation of the mouth is the same for a pour, mm. but I can't take my mask off. So that has been quite difficult. So I've con we've consulted with a speech and language pathologist by the name of Claudia Hogan. And I think she might be here tonight. And she has been an essential, unbelievably valuable resource. And she has helped me develop something called a sound wall. So I can't show my mouth to my students. So I will point to the um, image that is on my wall and I will have the students try and under their masks, make the same um, mouth formation. So I'm just gonna share the sound wall. We have an example of a sound wall in the slides that you have. So I'm just gonna kind of- For quickly, anyone who doesn't know what a sound wall is, quickly they show you are what that looks fantastic. Like. So this is uh, this is an English version of the sound wall. Um, it can be done in French. Like any, any of these strategies can happen in any language. And so this is an example of a sound wall. So instead of a, like a typical word wall where words would be associated by beginning letter. This is by sound. Word walls work for students who can identify beginning sounds. If you have a student who can't identify B, they don't know where to look on the alphabet. Whereas if the kids can say garçon, then the sound wall is far more effective, I find, for uh, students who are not yet readers. But again, you're wanting to work, you're wanting that explicit instruction and then that mastery. So making sure that they can identify the different sounds. Um, and that's where, you know, you come, that's where your small groups and your one-on-one -on -one comes in with working with students that are really struggling identifying the difference between those sounds. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, two more questions. No. One person wants to know, do the keywords that you present with your code pack have to be familiar to the students? And the other question is, what's, what is recommended? Teaching the name of the letter and its sound or vice versa or just the sound? The sound, I, well, it has to be both. 
it, it, it needs to be it needs to be both is the yeah. simple answer. Um, and again, when it comes to uh, words, this is a great opportunity to build their vocabulary. So I always use Leah or sorry, I don't know why I put my tongue there. Leah, um, because that's a word that's familiar. But this is a great opportunity to say, oh, mes amis, est-ce qu'il y a des autres mots qui commencent avec le son And sort of enhance their vocabulary, talk about new words. Um, but the key word, I use animals for the kindergarten class that I work because they like to sometimes act it out and that helps um, consolidate the sound and um, helps them with the reading. Yeah. My strategy is a little different. I like to use simple, simple words. Um, so like for me, acrobat would be a little bit diff well because it has a long it has a silent t and i know we're focusing on sounds um but for me it's a quite complicated word so my strategy is a little bit different than kim's but i mean that's okay we're both like my keywords are different so um like i would use the word sec because all of the sounds are decodable especially for early readers so i would use that sound so then we can work on it and we can put the sec together and oh that's the same as our keyword um, and link it together. So it really kind of depends on your own approach. A lot of teachers will also use the, like they'll ask the students for keywords. The students will make up yeah. the keywords. Or sometimes like, it, you know, if you have a letter and it's the student's name, that could be the keyword for it, right? Like why not? If Steve is in your class and you're working on <laughs> S's, Steve is the keyword for S. Kids laugh about it. They love it. They're like, ah, oh, Steve, Steve. Steve. But consistency is key. Consistency is key. It's a key word. You don't want to have 20 yeah, keywords. You're not having different one keyword. So you decide what your keyword is and you work with that because the reason is the keyword is the clue for the kids. So if you're going through your code pack and they forget, they, they see, you know, they see their code. Well, here we go. They see ah and they forget the keyword is my cue for them to remind them to think of the song. So I'm going to go acrobat and they're going to go ah because acrobat so it's really about being consistent with the keyword so the it's not the keyword is not important the sound has to be clear in the keyword so it has to be identified in the word ideally in the front but french has i, like I know i do like it's it. it's difficult for uh i i, uh, I always go there. je i choose menu she chooses uh, menu. um and U, uh, we said usine because it starts with u, but the kids love u u sa pu. They, <laughs> they, they think it's hilarious. So I like, I sometimes like, we do u u sa pu. I like boost because they know what a boost is, and it's again like I like the I like the smaller words that are de that are actually decodable. I like making um, them laugh. She like yeah. I'm not okay. Alicia has more questions for you. Thanks. I, uh, I do have one. It's kind of a larger question that we got from a secondary school teacher who said, you know, in the French program in secondary, when you have, you know, some students who can read fluently in both French and English and other students who can't read in either language or any language, how do you go about planning tier one instruction? Big question, I know. Okay, but hold on. I mean, this is what I, I'm in seven and eight. So this is sort of along the lines where I am. So how do you go about planning? You are going to, you're, I mean, you're essentially going to have to have two separate lessons in some capacity because you're going you're gonna to go through your lesson quickly. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, maybe is the person still here? Because I'd like to know if it's a core French or an immersion program. Like, are they talking about students that are dyslexic in an immersion program? Or are we talking about a core French program where we receive students that have some have learned the skills and some haven't? Hmm. Uh, so can we? I'm not sure. Um, if you heard the question and that, can you respond if that was you? Um, can they respond within it? Or? Sorry. We have so That's many questions. I'm kind of scrolling through trying to trying right. to find I mean, it. So. <laughs> It's a really, it's a really different answer because if it's in a core French program, then you're just going to review it. Like you're going to start, you're going to start basic and go through your sounds and your students that know it, they're going to listen to it. They might be bored for five minutes, but you're not going to, I mean, it's not going to be an hour long lesson. So you're going to start off simple for the students that don't, if you have several of them and you're going, <laughs> now I'm looking at the question and answer. Um, so you're going to start off simple. And so that's what I've done with my sevens, eight, my sevens that come in, I'm kind of assuming they know nothing. Some of them know some things and some of them don't. And I'm starting off at the beginning. Ah, so I actually started off with those, you know, that yellow list that we had with ba, ka, da, fa. And I, like, I literally created this with my grade seven 
um, um, extended immersion students and we read this. And then we read the simple words, mal, pal, bal, so that they could understand all the sounds. So we've done simple vowels. We're moving on to digraphs now with them. They do gram. So we're working on these because they do need to learn all of the sounds in the language. And so it's not a super long lesson that we're doing with them. It's more a short lesson at the beginning. And then the students that would need extra practice, I would work with them individually or in small groups. So let's say I have the other students working on a reading activity where they're comfortable reading you know, I don't know, a news story, then I would bring that other group and I would work individually with them on more decodable texts. If it's in an immersion class and you have a student um, and you have struggling students with dyslexia, then you're, I mean, you, in an immersion high school class, you're definitely not going back to the basics with your students. You're gonna be working with those students separately in small group and one-on-one. -on -one, 100%. And you're gonna kind of just be having them learn the rest like they're still going to gain from the rest of your immersion program but that you're going to need to work with them separately and that's too bad we got to that point sorry so i hope that answered the question because it wasn't super clear which program it was for yeah, that's okay mm -hmm. all right um are you ready to take a couple of more questions or tell us you know when you're done <laughs> I, I i mean are you okay or what yeah there's still a Okay, there's yeah. a really yeah. important question about dyslexia. Yeah, okay. a really great question is, do you, is it a good idea to teach a child with dyslexia both French and English at the same time? For example, for the sh sound, you have SH in English and CH in French. So, so the answer ahead. is French immersion is going to be a lot of work for students with dyslexia. And so is it possible? Absolutely. I work with students with reading disabilities all the time. I'm a student support teacher in French immersion. That's what I do. And students can learn both codes. Is it easy? Absolutely not. And the kids who are most successful learning both codes are those often who have parent support at home who can help them. And I strongly encourage mm -hmm. parent support. I've never seen a question that I need to address. Keep going. Okay, I strongly, strongly encourage parent support. And so I send activities home for parents, for students to practice at home with their children. I sent home the code packs. They each have a Ziploc bag, a very fancy Ziploc bag with the code that they have mastered. I never send home parts of the code that I haven't introduced. That would be silly because if the parents don't speak French, they can't teach it to their child. That's not the point of parent involvement. Parent involvement is having the parents hear what they have consolidated and the skills that they have learned in the classroom with me or in their small groups with me. I do send these home. However, I am very, very explicit in terms of what sounds I want them to practice and what blends I want them to practice with les livres de sang. Um, so can students with dyslexia learn two languages? Yes. Is it the right for each? Is it the right fit for each student? That's a family decision. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I have to address it a question possible. that's in here. Sorry, guys. I just it, I happened to open the Q and A. True or false? We should not worry about students with letter reversals unless they are still reversing them by the end of grade two. False. We this is as soon as students are doing. If we're hundred percent, we need to teach students the proper way to form letters right from the beginnings immediately it's hard to we break not, bad habits we're not waiting for we're not waiting for anything we're not waiting until grade three because that's when our school board assesses we are addressing issues as soon as they come up we're doing early screeners somebody asked what the name of the book was that we kept mentioning equipped for reading access we're doing our phonological screener in kindergarten so we can identify students that may have difficulties and then we are working with those students to ensure that they're successful. We are never leaving kids to wait for anything. Don't wait, correct it. Correct I mean, it. it's so much easier to teach them how to do it correctly than to try and break bad habits. They may eventually stop reversing, um, but if we've taught them the proper skills, then we know if it's act. So if we've taught them how to form letters early and we're reinforcing it, we're following up, we're gonna know whether those students are just having, you know, they're, they're going to develop typically and they're just making reversals or they're going to actually have difficulties with forming the letters and they're going to require regular and ongoing practice. And that's Sorry. why it is also, can I just put in a little tidbit there? That is why it's so important to show students the graphemes in kindergarten 
we don't want to wait until grade one to show students the letters. We can work on phonological awareness skills, but we also want to make sure that kids see what does la lettre de look like. We, we don't want to wait into grade uh, one for them to see the graphing. We want to introduce the graphemes, use the graphemes with the phonemes, make it all part of a structured literacy program. Oh, and sorry, I saw the response for the question about the high school students core and French. it was core French. So start from the beginning. <laughs> That's my advice. Start from the beginning. Your kids yeah. that already know it, they'll survive listening to it again for 10 minutes a day. Right. Okay. So uh, what I would like to say is thank you. And if anyone would like to ask more questions because time is running out, uh, you can write to Natalie and Kim at structuredliteracyfsl at gmail.com, right? Should and be on so, the slideshow as well, if you receive the slideshow. Yes, yes, good. And uh, I've provided the link also for, to receive the slideshow, so hopefully, but yes, that would be lovely if you could provide that as well. So uh, I would just like to say thank you again for your generosity, Natalie and Kim, with your energy, your wisdom, your advice, your dyna dynamism. I'm French. Dy <laughs> I don't know how to say that word in English. Dynamisme. <laughs> I don't know either. What is dy dy dynamism? Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> anyway, um, so we are so happy. And this is being recorded. Therefore, people can watch your video again and uh, watch your slides and have excellent information. So there is uh, a structured literacy French Structured Literacy resource on the IDA Ontario website. If you un look under resources, Literacy Structurée, there are many resources there if you'd like to go check. And uh, that's for anyone who'd like to visit our website. And uh, so uh, I would also like to add that there are webinars coming up. Um, Margie Gillis will be offering uh, a an assessment to drive literacy instruction webinar on April 11th, 2021 at 7.30. Uh, you may register on our website for that. Um, the Ontario Human Rights Commission will soon be uh, providing its report and we do have Ontario Human Rights Commission right to read inquiry information on the IDA Ontario website. Um, Dr. Uh, Kilpatrick will be presenting a workshop May 18th, uh, if you'd like to, and he'll be delving deeper into the phonological awareness and uh, word study uh, realm uh, uh, during his workshop as well. More specific information, case studies, um, and so if you'd like to register for that, that's on our website as well. Um, doc, Dr. Margie Gillis is providing a four day, four half day workshop in the summer in August, August 9th to the 12th. And um, that workshop will be entitled Nuts and Bolts of Literacy Assessments, Why, How and What. Again, Dr. Dr. Margie Gillis, a lot of wonderful, precious information. Um, she's excellent. So. Without further ado, again, thank you, Kim and Natalie, and everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you, Alicia, for helping with the questions. And Natalie has a question or just, a comment. I want to add one thing because I'm looking through the question and answers. You yes. guys have so many great questions. Great I questions. wish I could answer them all. Please send us an email. And also, I just want to say that structured literacy in French, there are very few resources out there. Yeah. We're literally making this up as we go along. Um, moment by moment. And so, I mean, we're not making it up. We're, we're using structured literacy approaches that are not made up. We're so making the those resources. Are, those are real. Um, applying it to French is a new concept. Um, many of the resources that are out there have been used in English, at, pretty much only English. And so finding resources in second languages and finding, I've seen a lot of questions about like, where do you find the rules? really difficult to find in French. That information is just not out there the same as it is in English um, because this is sort of a new area in FSL applying those structured literacy strategies. Orton Gillingham training is typically offered in English. Like it's very hard to find French Orton Gillingham training. And so as a result, um, I just want everybody to know, I know I don't want you to go out there looking for all these things and be like, I can't find anything. We can't find it either. It's not there for us either. Um, we're really doing like we're really looking up, trying to find. 
I mean, we've emailed about 1500 questions to Joanne with, where do we find this? You know, or we're always exchanging information and helping each other out. Yeah, we're supporting each other. So if you have information that we could benefit from, we would love for you to share it. And we also love to share what we know as well. And so it really is a new domain. So don't feel yeah. like you missed something out there because it's really up and coming and we, it's, not, it's not there. And we want to say a big thank you to Alicia and Joanne for too. hosting us. You are incredible hostesses and uh, we feel very, we're best. very grateful to, uh, to, to, share, yeah. to share with the IDA and to have this opportunity. Well, thank you so much. And I'd like to invite anyone, any of our spectators this evening, if you'd like to begin volunteering for IDA Ontario, we're always lo looking for volunteers. All right. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much.